Amen. You have to admit that nothing is cuter than the little bitty feet of a newborn baby. Absolutely precious. One of the joys of being a pappy is uh, getting to hold that little bundle of perfection and giving her back to her mom or dad when she begins to cry. Um, as I've shared with some of you, uh, she has already spoken her first words, uh, and it was, I love my pappy, and uh, it, was a, it was amazing, it really was. Again, I was the only person that heard it, but um, she and I understood what we were saying. When a child is born, there's such joy, there is... You take all the pictures, you, you, you do all the little things, and nowadays they, you know, they put everything out on social media so everybody can see the bundle of joy that they've had, and it's such a beautiful child, and, and, and we just get all excited about when a, when a baby is born. But I think that we fail sometimes as a church to have the same joy and excitement when someone is born again, born anew. When they have a new birth and uh, when something takes place in their life that is brand new, when literally the Bible says that God takes and gives us, puts upon us his righteousness. This new birth, this new life. And a lot of times when people come, especially if there's somebody that's really messed up in life, when they, they come from uh, a background of bad behavior, we uh, celebrate with skepticism, right? Be honest. We're like, I wonder how long this is going to take. I wonder how long this is going to hold. I, I wonder uh, how long until they mess up again. And, and a lot of the, the problem that, that we have with that is we've already anticipated someone uh, going backwards, going uh, against what they've just claimed to have done, and, and we don't properly celebrate this new birth. To be honest with you, we should probably be as excited, really more excited when someone is born again than when they're first born. Because at that point, they have been saved from the depths of hell. They have been saved from eternal punishment and torment and the judgment that is to come. They have been saved from that. They have been set aside, set apart. Something beautiful has happened. Something new has happened. Something amazing has taken place in their life. And, and the most important part, and I love this, is we have been adopted into the family of God at that point. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about the importance of a name and the importance of the name of God. I am who I am. The most important thing for you today is to have a new name, and that name is child of God. And this only comes by a new birth, something that takes place in the life of of a person. And and we're going to look at this this morning because there was a young man who should have known the word, he should have known the testimony of the prophets, and he should have known, been able to recognize the beauty of the one that was to come, but instead he came with skepticism to Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he came by night. He was so afraid to be recognized by his peers that that he came at night to, to Christ to ask him some questions. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 3. If you're visiting with us today, we do stand quite a bit in this service from time to time, but we definitely stand for the reading of God's Word. So let's stand together as we read the Word of God. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees. So this is a man who has knowledge. He has the understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. He he understood what was going on. Um, He knew of the coming of Christ. Um, and it says that named Nicodemus, he was a ruler of the Jews. So this man is high up. 
But it says that this man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi. Now, Rabbi means what? Teacher. Okay? We know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus responded and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born, what? Again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, well, how can a person be born when he is old? That has always confused me, by the way. Like this is a, this is a man who has wisdom and knowledge. He, he's a smart person. But he asked such a dumb question, right? How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is what? Flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is? Spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it is coming from and where it is going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. Nicodemus responded and said to him, well, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, you are the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you people do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up his, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes will have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world. I'm going to do the, the way I grew up learning it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged. How? Already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come to the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that his deeds will not be exposed, but the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed in God. Father, this morning we trust the reading of your word that it is complete, lacking nothing. So Father, give us wisdom as we open this up. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Born again. Nicodemus, well, how can a person be born when they're old? How can this happen? Do I enter a second time into my mother's womb? He totally had this misunderstanding. You see, born again is to begin life anew, or as it were, um, you're coming to a, a, a new manner of thinking, of feeling and acting with reference to spiritual things, undergoing a fundamental and permanent revo revo uh, revolution. Robert Jameson penned that. He said, this is what the idea of being born again, it is something that takes place in our life where everything that we once thought has completely changed. The way that we answered life we now answer it differently. The way we reacted, we now respond. The way that we once lived, we've turned our back on. The desires to live and honor God in all that we say and do. That's being born again. It is the Spirit of God coming in and doing what we could not do on our own. You and I can never, ever do for ourselves what the Spirit of God will do for us. That is the new birth. No matter how hard you try at being better, no matter how hard you try at being good, it will never take place. The reason that I can testify to that is because this is a man, Nicodemus, who would have been one of the greatest men of his generation. He was a leader of the Jews. He had an understanding of the Old Testament, but he had become so legalistic and such a fundamentalist that he had to do everything that the law said, even man's law, and he could not see with his spiritual eyes the gift that God had given. So he called Jesus a teacher. 
He could not look at Jesus as Lord. He could not look at Jesus as Savior. He was just a, a man, but he recognized something about Jesus. What, what did he recognize? He said, only a man who has God with him can do the things that you're doing. So he recognized that God was in his life, but he did not recognize who Christ actually was. And folks, this is important because there are a lot of people who say, I believe in God. The Bible says that the demons know there is a God and they tremble. You've heard me say this before, and I'm going to repeat it because I think it's got a lot of power to it. But back when 9-11 happened, September the 11th, we remember the attacks. We remember all that took place, the planes going down, the, the buildings being toppled. We remember all the deaths. And I remember, we're going to turn to God. We're going to turn to God. We're going to turn to God. And I said from the pulpit that I was preaching in, I said the only problem is, is we're not turning to Jesus. A lot of people will turn to God. But my friend, if you don't turn to the gift that he gave you, it does a nation no good. We must turn to Christ. America needs to be born again. But I've got news for you. So does the church. You, you, you want to know how the world gets to where it's at? The church allows it. The church allows it. You pay attention to what happens in our world today. The church is either ahead of it or they're following right behind it. It is so sad that we have to argue whether or not a woman should be a pastor. The Bible is very clear that that role is set aside for a man. That is a man's position, but yet we've got to argue, even in the Southern Baptist Convention, we've got to argue over it. It's the dumbest thing ever. But we're going to argue over things that the Bible has said clearly. And the reason we're going to argue over it is because, well, the world says it's okay, so therefore we should accept the world so that they'll come to our church. We change everything. Folks, you got to change methods from time to time, but you should never change the message. Amen. And being born again is more than believing in God or saying that I'm religious because I grew up in the country. You hear a lot of country songs that will mention God and beer, and they'll mention um, God and, 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 and the first time you did this with so-and-so. And the first. It's like we invoke God into things to make it okay. That's half of our problem. We need Christ. The church needs Christ. The world that is lost needs Christ. The person that you can't stand needs Christ. Perhaps you need Christ. This man comes and says, what, what do we have to do here? And Jesus responded to him and says, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Brother Tom, I'm a pretty good person. We talked about this last week. We're not good people. <laughs> I don't care how you spin it. We're not good people. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that for the majority of us in this room, maybe not all of us, but for the majority of us in this room, if we were to have a scale and we were to put every evil thought, every evil word, every evil deed on one side of that scale and then put everything we've ever done good, we would still be heavier over here than in the righteousness. Because remember, this is every thought, every word spoken, every evil. We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Being better than, being good enough is not being born again, born anew. And Jesus demands this. He says, you must be born again. And so perhaps you're asking the same question, not in the same way that Nicodemus did, but you're asking, well, Brother Tom, how, how can we be born again? How is that possible? What does it mean? So we ask, how then does this happen? How does, it, how does born again take place in our life. Jesus said these words, and I love this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
If you know anything about the Old Testament, water was a symbol often used for the cleansing power of Christ that was to come, the cleansing power of God that was active. And, and, and here, Jesus is saying something must happen. Well, how do I get cleansed? Jesus is not saying there's two different types of births. He's saying it's all one wrapped up in these two words. There's this cleansing that comes. How does it come? By the power of the Holy Spirit. When does the Holy Spirit enter into me? The moment that I give my life to Christ. The moment that I say to him, I am nothing, I am a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And the Bible says at that moment, the Spirit of God enters within me. That new birth, that cleansing takes place. Old things are washed away. Behold, all things have become what? Brand new. That's the work. That's born again. That's the power of the Spirit of Almighty God. A lot of people say, well, you're talking about baptism. No, folks, baptism, first of all, believer's baptism was not even a thing when Nicodemus was around. It hadn't taken place yet. Some people say, well, that's what he's talking about. No, you got to read it in context. We're, we're talking about here, he's going back to the Old Testament. He's talking here about water and spirit. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27 says... Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a, heart of, uh, a true heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and bring it about that you walk in my statutes and are careful and follow my ordinances. How does that happen? Not by being a better person, but by an act of God. This is what he's speaking of, this act that God does, this thing that takes place. In Titus 3, verse 5 says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which he did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the picture here? This is an act of God that takes place when we come to Christ. Something transforms us. Something changes everything about us. Suddenly we go from filthy to clean. And I don't know about you, but that's kind of hard for us to do on our own. How many of you raised boys? Just raise your hand if you raised boys. Okay. You will understand this. Okay. If you raised a girl, you might, but, but not so much as you would a boy. When I was a little kid, we raised pigs, okay? I went barefoot everywhere I was. Now, some of y'all just got grossed out, didn't you? Because that meant I was barefoot where? In the pig pen. And you know what a pig pen looks like. It's all prim and proper. Everything is perfect. It is beautiful. No, no, it is nasty, nasty. And you're in there, and you got that stuff, and you're with the pigs. And we used to, we had this big uh, do rock that we would ride. Literally, I said that. We'd tie a hay string on him, jump on his back, and we'd go. And, and believe me, that was good fun back in the day. Like, we, you kids think this is fun? No, get on one of those things and go. It's awesome. All right? Now, we would come in from working. And by the way, we also had to feed the chickens, gather the eggs. And y'all know how gathering eggs was fun at night because you never knew if the chicken snake was in there, right? And my dad would tell us, you didn't, you didn't get them when, you were, you know, when it was daylight. Get out there and get them when it's dark. Well, I want a flashlight. Nope, this will teach you. There is nothing more exciting than reaching inside and feeling something that's not an egg, <laughs> right? It's awesome. Teaches you some lessons, right? But when you come in, you're all dirty and filthy. You got to get in there. I would jump in the bathtub, jump in, and I'd jump right out. My mom would look, son, come here. Yes, ma'am. Let me see the bottom of your feet. No, ma'am. Get back in there. So I'd get back in there. Come here, son. Let me see behind your ears. No, ma'am. Get back in there. When you're trying to clean yourself up, there's always something you're going to leave out. 
That's why you need the super power, supernatural power of God to take what is filthy and make it righteous. Think about that for a minute. This crew in here, and we know each other. We, let's, let's be honest. We know each other. We know some of the dumb things we've done. We know some of the sinful things we've done. We know some of the prideful things we've done. And yet when we are born again, God stamps upon us approved. Approved. Justified. My son's righteousness stamped, boom, upon the heart of that person. This is impossible with men. Impossible. It's got to be the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. So he says this, unless someone is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh. That's our problem, people. Our problem is we are flesh. You and I are flesh. We think like flesh. We react like flesh. We live like flesh. This is the reason we struggle with so many things because of the flesh. If everything were easy, we would all be skinny and could run the marathon right? Let's be honest. We struggle with the flesh, right? We would all be smart, not just smart aleck. We would all have the same things. We struggle. We struggle. We struggle in the flesh. So what I'm telling you this morning is if you're flesh only, then you're in trouble. Because he says that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Something happens. Something transpires. Something takes place in a life of a person when they say, Father, I am filthy and in desperate need of a good cleansing. And God says, I sent my son for that. Nicodemus asks again, how can these things be? How can these things be? Jesus said the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it's coming from and where it's going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. I have watched people be freed from alcoholism, drug addiction. self-hatred and mutilation all by the power of the Holy Spirit. All by the power of new birth. Something happens. Something takes place in the life of a new believer. Transformation happens. Nicodemus wanted to know, again, how can these things be? He was thinking in the terms of what? Religion. What can I do to make this happen? Maybe you're asking the same question. Well, Brother Tom, what, what is it that I need to do to be born again? All you've got to do to be born again is very simple. Realize you can't be born again on your own. And trust that Christ has taken care of everything when he went to the cross. He says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. That's the cross. So that everyone who believes will have what? Eternal life. That, my friend, is the gospel. Religion is what can I do? The gospel is Jesus already did it. To be born again means I no longer look to myself. I'm no longer dependent upon me, but instead I am trusting in the work of God. So many people believe that they can do it. Here's the problem. It's God's love. That's what they want. They want God's love. But the problem is man rejected it because they chose religion. They still want to make it about them. But what can I do? What must I do? And if that's the case, then that equals eternal judgment. 
hell. If you believe in heaven, you've got to believe in hell. But for us that have been born again, listen to what happens. It's God's love plus faith in the full work of Christ. You heard didn't preach it before. You've heard me repeat it. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is what? Finished. So I believe fully in the full work of Christ. That is where my faith goes is in Christ, what he did. And what does that equal? It equals eternal life, which is being born again, born anew. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 7 says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the administration of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before briefly. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to mankind as has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the work of his power. What you and I need is not to be better. It's not to try harder. It is to fully put my faith in the work of Jesus Christ. And to say, very simply, I am not enough, but Jesus is. The next time you hear somebody say, pray this prayer with me, ask them why. Why? Well, I, 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 want, I want the numbers. I need you to pray this prayer so I can tell everybody that I got this many people saved. <laughs> Folks, if my praying with somebody saved them, I wouldn't need Jesus. <clears throat> it is you and I coming to a place of understanding. It is a matter of the heart. I have put my faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ. And I put my hope in that he's coming again. And oh, how I want to be at a funeral when he comes. I think there'd be nothing more awesome than seeing that casket open up and that body coming forth half the people fainting, <laughs> and I'm gone right after that. New birth, people, new birth. Father, this morning we confess to you that without you we are absolutely, hopelessly lost. You have given us the beautiful gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and all we have to do, Father, very simply, is to receive the gift that's been given. Quit trying to figure out what we have to do. There is nothing. As a matter of fact, if it was up to us to have to do something, none of us would be saved. But the Bible's very clear that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, I entrust myself and I entrust this church to the work of your son. But if there's someone here today who's never done that, Father, may they come today and say, I want to put my faith publicly in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.